Yep, we're good to go, Senator. Okay, I want to welcome everybody to the Senate uh, Energy and Natural Resource Committee. I'm Senator Kevin Avart. And before we get started, I'm going to read through a checklist to ensure that the meeting that we are holding is in compliance with the right to know law. As chair of the Senate Energy and Natural Committee, Natural Resources Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04 and its extensions, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen to contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. In accordance with the emergency order, I'm confirming that we're providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possible by video and other electronic means. We are utilizing Zoom for this electronic meeting and all members of the committee and selected legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously in this meeting throughout this platform and, public, and the public has access to contemporaneously watch and listen to the meeting on Zoom or YouTube and via, via, via phone by following the directions and links provided on the general court website. We provided a public notice of the necess necessary information for accessing the meeting in the Senate calendar. We are providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there's any problems with access. If anyone has a problem, please email remote Senate at ledge.state.nh.us or call 603-271-6931. In the event that the public is unable to access the meeting, it will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that all votes taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. And finally, let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please uh, also state where they are and if anybody else is in the room with them during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. So I'll start the roll call with Senator Guida. Senator Guida, I'm at my home in Warren, New Hampshire. Uh, daughter and grandson upstairs, dog around my feet, but alone in the room. <laughs> Senator Gray. Uh, this is James Gray. I'm in my uh, District 6 home in Rochester, and uh, I'm alone in this room. Senator Waters. Uh, Senator Waters at home in Dover, alone in this room. Senator Perkins Quoka. Yes, sir. Senator Perkins Quoka. I'm at my home in Portsmouth, and I am alone in this room. And I'm Senator Kevin Avard in my office in Nashville, New Hampshire. And I do have a roaming puppy, which is a labradoodle, and she likes to bark at squirrels. So if you hear her barking, everything's okay. It's copacetic. And with all that, we will start our, our meeting with Senate Bill. Help me out, Griffin. Sorry, uh, House Bill 529. Uh, House Bill 529. Yep. FN. And so we'll hear from the prime sponsor. So our prime sponsor is Representative Ellen Reed, Senator. Representative, you have the floor and welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is Ellen Reed. I represent Rockingham 17. That's the towns of Newmarket and Newfields. And uh, I would also really briefly like to give a, a quick shout out. I, I actually teach a course on American government Mondays at one. So when this was scheduled Monday at one, what I did was I had my students, they should be in attendance watching this as we speak and we'll, we will convene our normally scheduled uh, class right afterwards, but I just wanted to put that out to them. Um, well, welcome everybody if you're watching. <laughs> Thank you. So um, this uh, House Bill 529, uh, you may be familiar with, it creates penalties for cruelty to wildlife, which we uh, currently do not have in our statute. Um, the language has been refined over the last three years, three to four years actually, in close cooperation with the Fish and Game Department. It was drafted primarily by the department's lawyer, Paul Sanderson, with the advice of Colonel Kevin Jordan, who's the head of Fish and Game Law Enforcement, who was able to inform on the process, uh, inform the process based on the needs of law enforcement and the cruelty situations that they have encountered. I believe both Mr. Sanderson and Colonel Jordan are present to offer their testimony in support. But this is a result of a very long and very bipartisan effort 
Um, it has been placed in Title 18, which is the Fish and Game title, according to the House Fish and Game Committee um, request after, after previous versions. And it has been written in such a way that is both workable for law enforcement, as I said, while affording the absolute highest level of protection for the hunting, angling, and trapping community. Um, this bill also, for the first time, I'm proud to say, has the support of the Fish and Game Commission. Uh, just brief history on it. It, it was on cons the consent calendar out of the House uh, out of criminal justice last year, but was one of the many casualties of, um, of COVID last year, unfortunately. Um, this year, it's also, again, out of the House on consent, the Criminal Justice Committee waived the second hearing. So <clears throat> to get into the meat of it, New Hampshire is one of only three states that has no criminal statute for cruelty to wildlife. Um, I want to go over kind of like the little bit of the nuts and bolts of the bill and why it's worded in the way it is. First, the idea of what is cruelty. You, you'll note that cruelty is not actually in the language of the bill. It's only in the title of the bill. Um, the actual behavior that's identified in this bill is, quote, beats, cruelly whips, tortures, or mutilates. And that language was chosen to match because it is identical to the um, section that we have for domestic animals. So that is the language we have in statute that, that describes the behavior that's prohibited for domestic animals. So it is a very narrow definition and we, we, I saw it and we sought to change as little as possible by extending this one piece of the domestic cruelty statute that we do have existing to, uh, to wildlife. Um, you'll also note that there are two different levels or penalties here. One is for purposeful behavior. The other is for negligent behavior. In criminal law, there are four mental culpability states, as you may already know, purposeful, willingly, recklessly, and negligently. Purposeful is premeditated and planned with the explicit goal of carrying out that actual behavior and is very, very difficult to prove in court. Um, so we wanted to have a higher level um, offense for the most egregious situations. And in order to match, again, matching the domestic cruelty statute, the domestic animal cruelty statute, um, here, purposeful cruelty to wildlife is set at a class B felony, again, just to match what we currently have for domestic animals. Um, so again, this is reserved only for the most egregious cases where that can actually be proven because you have to prove intent and planning and all of that in a, in a court case. Any behavior that falls short of that most, you know, highest level planning um, would fall all the way down to the lowest level of mental culpability, which is negligent, um, which is set as an unspecified misdemeanor. I had originally set this at recklessly last year, but Colonel Jordan made the very good point that in New Hampshire, someone who is under the influence while committing a crime can only be charged at the negligent level. So it was by his request that we set that at negligent in order to capture people who were engaged in cruel behaviors while they were under the influence. Um, further over the many, many hearings and many versions of this bill, we've heard many what if scenarios as I'm sure you're all familiar with. We, we've, as legislators, we frequently go into the what ifs on a bill. Um, the ideas of, you know, what if we were to accidentally hit an animal or what about, you know, worms on hooks or mice and mouse traps or um, what about needing to uh, dispatch an animal who is suffering. Um, and the, it's important to note here that the criminal justice RSA that exists for mental culpability states, the description of negligent requires the behavior to be a gross deviation from the conduct that a reasonable person would observe in the situation. So again, uh, we could do the what ifs, but it has to be a behavior that would be a gross deviation from a, what a, the conduct a reasonable person would observe in that situation. Um, so, and then the last section, just briefly, um, that's the affirmative defense section. This is the part where we really gave the strongest uh, available protections to the hunting and angling community. Um, affirmative defense says that even if a defendant can be proven to have committed the crime, in certain cases, the jury will still be instructed to acquit, which obviously means no prosecutor would, would ever prosecute that case. Um, here, that case is that, and I'll just read it, it shall be an affirmative defense to prosecution and an actor shall be exempt from enhanced penalties under this section for any manner of taking open season time limits, permitted scientific investigations or wildlife management practices lawful under Title 18 or administrative 
rules uh, adopted pursuant to RSA 451, whether or not the actor holds a current and valid license. So this means that even if you had them dead to rights on absolutely cruel behavior, you had a video of them engaging in, in absolute cruelty, if a person was involved in a lawful behavior under Title 18, Title 18, of course, being the fishing game title that includes hunting, fishing, trapping, but also pest management, nuisance animal man management. Um, if any of that was done during lawful behavior under Title 18, the jury would be instructed to acquit. And so no prosecutor would start that to begin with. Um, so there, there cannot be any stronger uh, legal protections for, for the hunting community. So, so that's kind of the nuts and bolts of, of the different pieces here. Um, I just wanna talk really briefly about why this is needed and necessary. Uh, the first time I heard of the concept of this bill, it wasn't my bill. I was a, com a committee member on the Fish and Game Committee, but I am very active as a representative and I've worked on legislation for years before becoming a representative. So I had attended and participated in a whole bunch of different hearings and I have never ever in my life been so moved to disgust as the hearing that I heard on, on this issue. Um, largely the testimony from wildlife rehabbers um, as to the kinds of acts that people are willing to do to animals. Uh, just briefly, we're talking about turtles that had been run through with screwdrivers or halved with cleavers and left to die. Um, raccoons and other animals trapped in cages and having fireworks lit in their cage or some even being set directly on fire. Um, these animals then dying from third degree burns. Um, and one person even went so far as to torture a turtle on the internet and threatened to do more and more horrendous things to it unless he got a certain number of likes. Uh, there are instances of people in, in, these are instances in New Hampshire, intentionally running down turkeys and ducks, stomping on litters of baby skunks. And when people have called the, the fishing game department to complain about this, um, they are told that there is very little that the law enforcement officers can do about it, that at most the, the officers can issue a violation, a, a ticket for disturbing wildlife or perhaps for non-allowable take. So uh, why is it important to have those criminal penalties for this cruel behavior? Aside from the fact that obviously wildlife are capable of feeling pain just like your dog or cat, and many of you just mentioned that you have animals in your life that you enjoy and, and love, um, obviously wildlife can feel that pain just the same. So aside from it being a morally depraved act to intentionally torture an animal just to watch it suffer, the people who do these kinds of things don't always or even frequently stop at animals. All the data show an extremely strong correlational link between sadistic violence towards animals and violence towards people. Because it turns out the same psychological tendency that drives one to cause wanton suffering in an animal leads them to do the same thing to human beings. Uh, again, back to that very difficult um, committee hearing on this issue, we heard testimony from a woman who grew up near a boy who would frequently torture and kill wild birds and animals until one day he came after her. She managed to escape, but eventually after years of practice, he went after another boy, uh, another person, a, a young boy. He bashed that boy's brains in and sexually molested his body. By the time he was caught, he had killed several people and he had become one of the few famous serial kill killers from New Hampshire. His name was Terry Rasmussen, also known as Bob Evans. He, like other sociopaths, had practiced on wildlife, specifically wildlife, before graduating to people because wildlife, unlike domestic animals, are not missed. Everyone will miss the neighborhood cat or someone's dog, but no one notices when a raccoon or a turtle goes missing. So having a criminal statute allows us to intervene in these situations before they graduate to murdering people. And I'll just close by saying, New Hampshire is very proudly rural. Um, tourism to our rural areas is our, uh, our second largest industry. And we so value wildlife in this state. We put moose on our license place. We sell all kinds of New Hampshire souvenirs that are plastered in images of our wildlife. Um, I am very willing to bet that someone on this call right now is either wearing an image of wildlife or sitting next to an image of wildlife. 
I would just suggest that if we love our wildlife so much, we should protect them from the most egregious and most unthinkable acts. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much for your testimony and for bringing this bill to us. Um, are there any questions from the committee members? Senator Guida. Yeah, I'm looking to uh, Roman two. Um, I'm, the language to me seems confusing and it's because I'm probably not familiar with it, but enhanced penalties, plural, would indicate there, there's some other stuff at play here. And for, for any manner of open season time limits, I'm not sure what that means. Yes, Senator, thank you for the question. So enhanced penalties here, I believe penalties it can be used generically or generally to refer to the fact that we are creating enhanced penalties by making this uh, a criminal violation, but there, and there are two different culpability states. So there's a, a felony level and a misdemeanor level. So I think that's where the plural is coming in. Uh, and, I, and I'll answer this, but I also wanna, again, raise your awareness that the drafter, uh, the Fish and Game Department's own lawyer, Paul Sanderson is on and is happy to answer this. I believe we'll be happy to answer this question in more detail. Uh, as far as the manner of taking open season time limits, et cetera, what I know that to be saying, and again, Mr. Sanderson can expound on it, is that any lawful behavior described under Title 18 is exempt from this penalty. So, and, and, and that behavior would be the open season time limits notwithstanding. So if you're, for example, if you're engaged in hunting, and so that's a legal behavior, a lawful behavior under Title 18, even if you're hunting out of season, that is still an exempt behavior. Um, I hope that begins at least to answer the question. Um, and I, as I said, Mr. Sanderson can speak further to it. Questions from the committee? I'll take a follow-up if I may, Mr. Chairman, well, after Mr. Sanderson, after Mr. Sanderson speaks. Um, okay, I do have one question with regards to the fish. Um, say I, say uh, somebody's a, a young child or an adult or anybody is catching a fish and it's a kibby and it's squirreling around, it's their first time and it's, it's uh, they're afraid of it and uh, it perishes. I mean, is that, you know, because it's on the hook and they don't know how to get it off. Uh, how does that apply to that? The... Exactly, thank you. And this is what I was kind of referring to about the what ifs that we all do as legislators. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a very good question and one that we've certainly discussed at length in the House Committee over the, the several iterations of this bill. So two pieces protect uh, that from being cruelty. The first piece is that um, everything under Title 18, including fishing. So this is a lawful behavior engaging, you're engaged in fishing, therefore any kind of like, oh, the, the fish kind of like flounders around and, and dies kind of a not very pretty death, it's still exempt, you were engaged in fishing. Um, and also, as I said, in the definition, so for, this would never, you know, happen as a purposeful, right? So if you're talking about like an accidental, what if I was accidentally cruel in the process of doing something else? So at worst, that would fall as a negligent offense. But as I already said, in order to qualify as a negligent offense, that behavior has to be a gross deviation from what a reasonable person would have done. So even if it wasn't for the affirmative defense piece, which again, the affirmative defense piece is the strongest legal protection and it completely exempts anything you're doing while you're hunting, fishing, trapping um, or pest management. Even if it was not for that, you would have to have been engaged in a gross deviation of normal behavior while doing that in order for that to even rise up to a negligent offense. Um, and certainly if you're just normally fishing and even the practice of um, sometimes putting a fish kind of out of its misery by, by hitting it over the head is a common practice. So that would not be a gross deviation of normal behavior. All right, I just have one more because uh... <clears throat> Just curious, because some kids like to play at the beach and they like to lift rocks and, and go after crabs and things of that nature. And they're actually playing with it, but I'm sure the animal doesn't, or the crab doesn't feel like it, it wants to be played with, obviously. Would that fall under the same type of uh, cruelty? 
Well, it would have to, again, remember that that definition for cruelty. Again, we're not actually saying cruelty. Cruelty itself would be a very kind of nebulous word, but the actual definition is to negligently beat, cruelly whip, torture, or mutilate. Mm. And so it would literally have to be that one of those very specific um, definitions in order to to even begin to possibly qualify and then again it's you still have to overcome the affirmative defense and the negligent definition or the purposeful definition which are both very very high um, and i will further say that you know again we are one of only three states so all of almost all of the other states have some form of this in place and in most cases much stronger than this without the protections for uh, the hunting community that are in this bill and there's no state that is you know prosecuting eight-year-olds playing with with starfish so um i i don't always say that i just implicitly trust law enforcement but i trust law enforcement not to uh to go after an eight-year-old playing with a starfish I uh, thank you, Representative Reed. You were very uh, eloquent on your, your uh, uh, presentation. Uh, any further questions? Seeing none. Thank you very much. And we'll uh, we have uh, who's our next testifier? Uh, Senator yeah. Perkins Polka, did you have a question? I thought you raised your no, hand. No, I was just waving to the representative from my district. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, Jen? Next up, we have Representative Lang. Representative Lang, welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senators. I'm Representative Tim Lang. I serve the towns of Tilton and Samerton and Belknap 4. I'm also the chair of the House Fish and Game Committee. I speak in support of this bill. Um, this bill came out of committee on a 19 to 1 vote, was put on a consent calendar, and was uh, voted on a voice vote. Um, as part of this bill, because of the enhanced penalties, and I'll speak to that for Senator Guy's sake, um, this bill would normally have gone to the Criminal Justice Committee in the House. The House Criminal Justice Committee had already seen this bill and the committee chair was confident in the language and waived the hearing and send it directly to the Senate. That's why you have it so fast in front of you. Um, lastly, the, um, to, again, talking to the, um, I sat on the House Fish and Game Committee uh, as, a, as a sub for a while last year when this bill was brought forward and I voted against this bill last year, whereas I voted for it this year. Um, due to the affirmative defense language that's in this bill. Um, again, if you're legally taking for me, the conversation is around deep sea fishing. Um, you know, it's not uncommon for you to have to use a, a club to take care of a, a fish that you might have caught. Um, and I was con concerned that that might be uh, mis misused, this, this statute. And the affirmative defense language was added in here to if I'm legally in the process of taking a fish, and that's the normal process for dispatching of a fish in that, in that circumstance, then it, you would not be subject to this law. So it made me much more comfortable with it. Um, as part of the hearing, we heard from the agricultural community. Um, there was concern about what happens if a, a, a farmer, which is not an uncommon occurrence, is haying a field and they accidentally uh, injure a, a, a deer that's lying in the grass. Um, and they dispatch that deer by hitting it with a tire iron or some sort of other form to dispatch it and put it out of its misery. And we were heard from Fish and Game that in that circumstance, that is already covered under other statutes, under agriculture, and it would not be subject to this as well. Um, lastly, just to speak to um, some of the guidance question about why it talks about enhanced penalties in that last section. Um, if you read the whole of chapter 206A, which is the title is called General Penalties, um, whereas this is uh, it's 206 19-A, this is 206 19-B talking about enhanced penalties. So again, it, it's speaking to this whole chapter that's titled enhanced penalties, um, and that's why that chapter is in there. I would highly recommend the uh, committee uh, pass this bill and move forward. And I know you have uh, Mr. Saunderson and Colonel Jordan online. I'm sure they're going to be much better at answering questions. So unless there's really some pressing question you want from the chair of fishing game at the house, I will waive off any questions. Uh, thank you. I, I, any questions from the committee? Uh, thank you, Representative. We appreciate your testimony. Jen? What's up? We have Kurt Ehrenberg. Welcome, Kurt. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak today. I uh, represent the Humane Society of the United States of America, and uh, 
Um, this actually is the first hearing that I've spoken for the organization at. So just give me that uh, leeway if I, but all I, all I think we have to add, um, and I, I think that there are people much more qualified than I to speak on the particulars, but I would say um, the most, some of the most important things to remember is the, the, there are the exemptions, so anything covered under current law continues to be as has been said. So that concern, I think, has been covered. Um, but I would say it's important to recognize there's, there are serious public safety reasons to support this bill. Um, violence does not exist in a vacuum. Animal abusers are also people abuser, abusers. Um, it's, a strong er, it's a strong early predictor that an individual will go on to commit violence against humans. Um, and there are statistics to bear that out. We've provided those to, to all of you, I believe, today. Um, there are two documents and uh, we have written testimony that you can refer to. Um, I just close by saying that, you know, the attributes that we all rely on and love in this state, um, a part of that, you know, are things like loons nesting on Squam Lake and wild rabbits running in the yards and um, things like that. And we should be like most of the states in the country and protect uh, the wild animals that provide us so much in this state. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Kurt. We appreciate your testimony. Um, is there any questions for Kurt? Thank you very much. Jen. Hi, so I have a Laura Silt and um, Catherine Corker. You both signed up to speak, but I'm not seeing them. So if you could raise your hand and then in the meantime, we'll go to Paul Sanderson. Welcome, Paul. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, after Representative Reed and Representative Lang gave their full and complete testimony, the only thing I would add for you at this point is the criminal statute that they were referring to for domestic animals and wildlife in captivity is RSA 644-8, part of the criminal code, if you wish to compare that at any given time. Other than that, it probably would be best if I answered any questions that you might have. Uh, I have one, if that's okay. Um, with regards to the uh, the fines, I'm seeing 55, 53, 78, 309. Uh, uh, are those accurate? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what you're referring to, Mr. Chairman. Uh, judicial violation level of offense, $53. Oh, oh, on the fiscal note, I see. Okay. Uh, yes, those were coming from the judicial branch. Um, Where does that money go? Uh, fines for fish and game offenses are given over to the fish and game department. And so why are they so low? Uh, because our fines are set as part of a uniform fine schedule uh, that requires probably review and updating to bring it to current values. I think so. I think that's the only thing I'm having an issue with. I mean, if you're cruel, if you're being cruel and you're going to be, uh, there's like, uh, you're, <laughs> this doesn't seem just, but um I'll, I'll, I'll think about this. Questions from the committee. Senator Waters. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Paul. So would it be fair to say that I've, you know, I've looked at 644 colon eight. And so would it be fair to say that essentially what we're doing here is using basically the same language and affording the same protections to wild animals not in captivity as is in current statute for wild animals in captivity. And the only difference is that we have the carve out for lawful taking. Yes, Senator, that was our intent. And most of the effort in crafting the statute had to do with that exact carve out that you're speaking to, to make sure that we did not unintentionally uh, make uh, lawful hunting, angling and trapping behaviors into some sort of criminal conduct. That was not our intent. If I may follow up, Mr. Chairman. Yes, follow up, go ahead. Um, so in a sense, uh, following up on um, the chair's question about young people that, um, I mean, it's actually a twofold question. Um, there's no differentiation by age in terms of the existing 644 colon eight. And so the, I guess the question becomes, um, 
Are you aware of any issues that have, or any enforcement that has occurred uh, in terms of the kinds of scenarios, you know, um, kind of equivalent scenarios um, to what S Senator Avard was describing? Uh, personally, I have not been involved in cases of that type. Perhaps the Colonel does have some information on that, but what I could tell you in general, remember that our juvenile laws under RSA 169C and 169D are applicable here too, so that these could potentially be involved with children as a type of either chins or delinquency type behaviors, uh, 169B actually for, deliver, for delinquency. Uh, but again, to be cautious because in the laws, there are exceptions in game uh, they're not normally treated as juvenile delinquency. So it is potentially possible that you might have a 16 or 17 year old engaging in some of this behavior who might be tried as an adult. But as to you much younger children, I'm sure that they would be brought before juvenile authorities and treated under 169B or 169C for a resolution of these types of behaviors as more of a family problem. Yeah, thank you for that. And just the last follow up. I mean, oh. so I think it'd be fair to say that we'd have to be talking about something that was just egregious and repeated for what we would no longer call childhood behavior to rise to the level that it might fall under the statute. That's correct, Senator, yes. Thank you. Um, any more questions from the committee? I, I'm, really, I'm really stumbling over this, uh, the fines, actually. I, I just, I mean, how, how much does it cost you to, to, to prosecute one of these? Is a violation? I mean, what, what is that? I mean, is it, it, are we losing, is the department losing money just to, to process one of these? Uh, what we're starting here, Senator, is a rather long conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I know that, but I'm, I, when was the last time these fines were updated? Uh, I'm not sure of that exactly, but I think it was over 10 years ago. Right, so that's, uh, that's something, I don't wanna hold up this bill, but uh, is there a way that we can fix this in, in the future? Or I, I'll give you a, a short answer to a very long and complicated problem. That's great, I like that. The, the short answer is that right now, all of our offenses are prosecuted through the court system. Uh, and as a result of that court system, there can be a monetary fine and there can be a loss of your license privileges, be they hunting, fishing, trapping, whatever, for a period of a year. So that's our general penalty that you'll find under RSA 20619A. There is a possibility for us to handle some of these offenses on an administrative basis and treat it like a ticket. Okay. But we don't have those particular processes in place at this time. We certainly could in the future. Thank you very much. And Senator Waters. Yeah, um, just thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I'm wondering, Paul, um, in looking at that fiscal note, is are those not the fines, but actually the costs associated with processing the fines? I think that's the case. Those aren't the fine levels. That's the cost of processing the fines, right? That, that, that could well be because that uh, part of the fiscal note came from the judicial branch. Yeah, I mean that's what the that's what the fiscal note says that that's the cost associated, not not the revenue, um, right? So that that I mean that's a whole other issue about yeah. the cost of doing business, but the the fines are, are are different and more. Yes, and and I'm sorry, senators, I don't have that uniform fine fine schedule in front of me to give you the actual numbers of the fine that would be imposed. All right. Thank you very much. Any uh, other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Next up, we have Colonel Jordan, I believe. Colonel, welcome. Good, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, so may, hopefully I can answer some of your questions. Uh, Senator, regarding the fines. So one thing that, that you need to bear in mind is the courts, <clears throat> excuse me, have been very good uh, about at the conclusion of any, any crime or offense that we bring before them, uh, in the case of a felony or a misdemeanor or a serious offense such as one of these that would be brought, uh, the court has a discretion to take recommendations from the prosecution and go off that chart. So for instance, a fine that uh, bringing in a violation offense um, and getting a, a guilty conviction or a misdemeanor offense that's egregious 
it is not unusual for a prosecutor to ask for an enhanced penalty. Uh, part of that being a higher fine, the courts have always been very willing uh, to do that, which is very helpful. And I, I do, so that's in one, uh, trying to answer one part of your question is that we can go off of that and, and make recommendations in the court very uh, often will follow our recommendations. So on felonies or class A misdemeanors, uh, like some and, and the more serious crimes like what you're discussing here today, it would certainly the, the enhanced penalty would go into effect. You wouldn't go in there and, and ask for a fine of $120. You'd come in and ask for a fine of $1,500 and probably be successful in getting that. That's number one. Number two, when you do have more time, uh, uh, Mr. Sanderson and I have a good solution to some of this. Uh, that we discussed earlier about bringing some of this stuff into the department for administrative duties, uh, which will save the court money and, and also help uh, enhance some of these fine amounts. But getting back to the bill, I would agree with Paul that Ellen uh, Reed, Representative Reed and uh, Commissioner Lang, uh, uh, the committee chair, chairman Lang did a really good job explaining how this thing came about. I'm very confident when I tell you as a committee and as a, as a person who enforces these laws that this is a well-crafted bill. Uh, it is done with the idea of protecting those who deserve protection uh, in the way of kids making a mistake or a person being put in a situation that they have no option, as opposed to someone who sets out to cruelly dismember or injure an animal. And a good example of this uh, would have been the young uh, kids or high school age kids up in Conway who beat the wood ducks uh, last year so tragically um, in a gang mentality. That's that's where this type of bill would have been very helpful. I'm not saying that I would have necessarily used it because every scenario was different, but you certainly could have charged that to bring people to the table to get those kids the proper help that they needed to address that type of behavior so it didn't occur again. So New Hampshire has functioned a long time without this. Uh, we do have laws that we could use, uh, things like illegal manner of take, you know, but they just, they don't have the teeth in them that a felony level option would give you. Mm -hmm. As you know, and I don't want to offend any attorney, but as a prosecutor for many years, the best way to get attorneys to the table is serious crime sometimes. And then you'll get a serious discussion on how to address that type of behavior. And in fact, go to good measure to rehabilitate these people. This law will allow us, if this were to become law, this would allow us that opportunity where before all I could threaten with was a fine, a simple fine and, and not even a loss of any kind of a license really in most of these things. So this is gonna give us a tool um, to address the more serious offenders. And at the same time with this, um, the enhanced penalty section and the affirmative defense really protects people that are not meeting this. Some of the some of the examples that were already given, you know, farmers were concerned they ran over a fawn, which is easy to do, that they would be considered, it would be considered cruel if they put the animal out uh, or they'd be reckless in their behavior and doing it and, and even being out there and farming and, and the affirmative defense protects all of that. So we're confident uh, that it is well written and it will be used correctly. Uh, I will say in answer to Senator Waters, I had a great question about have we, have we had a history of this law in the criminal statute being used? And the answer to that would be no. I've not seen or heard of that. Uh, the difference between fish and game and criminal law is that uh, persons age of 16 and older are considered adults. Criminal law, it's the uh, age of maturity. So it's a little bit different for fish and game. We could have a 16-year-old charged with a felony if we choose to do that. Um, you know, based on the behavior. But I would offer to you that Fish and Game has always done that. And we've been very careful about that particular step, but it gives us the tool to do it if the behavior in fact warrants it. So um, I think there is a good history under the criminal law. I, I think we'll have a good history with this one because it mirrors it, uh, except the only, the only variation in this law is I think we've taken an added step to protect those who, um, are innocent from it. So with that affirmative defense passage. So I would encourage you to consider it. I think it's long overdue. I think it was a good um, a working teamwork to put it all together. I think we got a lot of views from all the different interests and uh, and I think it's it's well done. Thank you. That, that I'll take any questions. That, any Thank you very much, Colonel, for your testimony. Are questions from, from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. 
So Senator, we still have Catherine Corkery and Laura Slilt to speak, but I don't see them air here, but we do have a Gina Scorfano with her hand raised. All right, let's have, let's hear from her. Welcome, Gina. Um, good evening, Chair and members of the committee. I hope you can hear me well. There's a little bit of chaos going on and, and um, with some yard work here. Um, I, my name is Gina Scorfano. I am a resident um, of and I'm calling today in strong support of HB 529FN. I think that um, the primary sponsor did a fantastic job and everyone who has testified so far. So I will try to be very brief and just highlight some points that they may or expand on some points, I should say. Um, in terms of that example, the 2019 case with the Kennett um, High School kids from North Conway, um, where they lure the duck, um, which is a game regulated species um, and severely beat the duck with the broomstick, that again would have just been a violation under existing law um, for unlawful take, which is a mere monetary fine. An example of another case, um, which is noteworthy in contrast to that lack of ability to seek suitable prosecution there, in October of last year, two men were charged for allegedly beating several porcupines to death with a baton in Rockland, Maine. They were both charged with aggravated felony cruelty. And while having implemented a law that allowed for felony level penalties in that case, citizens in Maine have continued active involvement in hunting, fishing, and trapping activities, which of course HB 529 FN also proposes with its placement within the Fish and Game Code, Title 18, um, <coughs> and affirmative defense to allow those lawful activities. I just do want to highlight, again, even the most valuable species, species leave us without suitable consequences under existing law, even moose, which were extremely strict um, with a lottery system, only 50 permits were granted in 2019. Unlawful take of a moose again is a violation, a monetary fine and during a closed season would just be a misdemeanor. And certainly a misdemeanor is not fitting for purposeful torture or mutilation such as setting off on fire um, and fireworks, um, et cetera. Um, in terms of the link between animal cru cruelty and human violence, I want to point out that evidence of those links became so compelling in 2016 that the FBI started tracking those cases nationally and they did categorize them as a crime against society. In 2017, we heard from David Goldstein, um, the Franklin Chief of Police from New Hampshire. He testified to the New Hampshire Fishing, Fishing Game and Marine Resources Committee. And he shared that in a study of 36 convicted multiple murderers, 47% of them admitted committing acts of animal torture. In 2002, an animal research study found that 100% of people who committed sexual homicide reported that they had abused animals. And 99% of animal abusers had convictions from other crimes, including sexual assault, homicide, arson, and firearms offenses. So when we talk about, because some people bring up the point, well, where is all this wildlife cruelty occurring? Why don't we see or hear these issues being reported? Um, for one thing, I would argue that um, if we did have uh, means of suitable prosecution, then the news media would have um, court documents, they would have charges that were filed, they would have trials that are existing in order to follow and cover and report to um, local media. Um, a lot of times when these cases occur, like the primary sponsor pointed out, wildlife really isn't missed um, where domestic animals are. are. Um, so when we look at these statistics, these percentages that proves this link between animal cruelty and human violence, and we think about the fact that these types of crimes occur in New Hampshire all the time. And when you realize the fact of that link there, those high statistics of the link, then you have to realize the fact that these animal cruelties are indeed taking place. I want to quickly highlight too, we had a concern in the past about those who are afraid that they might um, be charged with a crime if they were protecting themselves um, from an animal. And I just want to highlight that that is part of the current Fish and Game Code 
that is included in that exemption that we have in this bill it is RSA 207 semicolon 26 in Title 18. And it does allow any person to pursue wound or kill on land owner occupied by a person, any unprotected bird or wild animal to protect themselves or their property from damage. And I wanted to just raise a point in regards to mental illness. We had a concern about this. And um, I wanted to just point out that there is no exemption for mental illness in the current animal cruelty code, um, nor in the language of this bill for many reasons. Um, there are over 200 defined classified forms of mental illness. Uh, mental illness can be complex. Um, and the impact from them can range from mild to severe. And I would argue that only those who are licensed and specifically educated to define and diagnose mental illnesses are equipped to do so. Um, because animal cruelty involves the desensitization, disregard or desire to inflict suffering on an innocent sentient being, um, one can argue that animal cruelty cases involve mental illness on some level. So if we were to attempt to create an exemption for mental illness in this bill, we would run the risk of it being so complicated that it would render it unenforceable. And that can be looked at also in terms of minors. Um, I would also note that under existing law, in addition to um, protection for minors, um, as well as mental illness, current court practice does have the lawful ability to include mental health rehabilitation, diagnosis and counseling in the sentencing on a case by case basis, which they do. Um, and the defense, al the defense also has a lawful ability um, and some would argue the obligation to enter an insanity plea or raise the issue of mental illness or inability to understand whether that involves a mental illness or their age level um, and maturity level and education um, in their defense. And a successful insanity plea would leave the prosecution with absolutely no ability to argue any culpability and that case would be dismissed. And HB 529 FN does not hinder or change those facts in any way. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank any you questions much. from the committee? Thank you very much, Gina. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, Senator, that's all the people that I have signed up for the bill. So if you're looking to speak on this bill, if you could please raise your hand. I'm not seeing anyone, Senator. Okay, seeing that, we'll close the hearing on that and we'll start off with the next one with the HB 342. Okay, and the prime sponsor is Representative Spillane. Welcome, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chair and yeah. members of the committee. Is it time for mud rocking or? <laughs> uh, the mud racing, it's, it's, uh, it's gonna be going this year, but they've trimmed down the number of races. So um, oh. I'm not sure what, how many we'll get to do this year. Uh, yeah. That's like really not as many. Anyway, you got the floor. Thank you. This uh, this bill I have brought forward. Uh, I'll first mention that it did come out on consent, unanimous out of the committee. Um, it also has an amendment attached to it that was the request of Fish and Game to help clarify some confusion in some of their the law already. And I'll let you know that I will be following up with Fish and Game for next year to also introduce another housekeeping bill that further clarifies language. Um, so we, if you find anything that you find confusing, you can also contact me and we'll try to move that in there along with that one. But this bill here is simply a safety bill. There are areas of the state that are designated shotgun and handgun only. And there is no dispute at all that a rifle is more accurate than a handgun and allows you to place your shot more accurately, avoid stray bullets and uh, constrain what you're actually shooting bullets at downrange. Um, the reason that I went with a lever action carbine is that one, it is very popular and available in the cartridges that we're talking about, which are the same exact cartridges used in, in the handguns that are allowed in these areas. And two, the, the barrel length is short. So the difference between the maximum length of the handgun, which is, uh, I believe, 13 inches. My, I can be corrected by, um, by Sanderson or, or um, 
Jordan, if if, uh, if I'm wrong on that, I think it's 13 inches. And the, uh, the average length of this barrel being um, 18 inches does not allow for an increase, a significant increase or anything of note to the increase of the velocity of the bullet. So in essence, you're shooting the same exact bullet that is currently allowed out of the handgun. And I have some ballistic charts I can send to you uh, in email for you to look at. Same bullet that you would shoot from the handgun, which is allowed, but we're giving it a more accurate platform to be shot from, which gives you the ability to have a shoulder stock to hold your, your gun steady and to also uh, place because of the length of the barrel, the accuracy is a lot better to make sure that you're hitting what you're actually shooting at for a target. And the reason that some of these areas are shotgun and handgun only is because we wanted to constrain the Act, the activity of hunting to those rounds that are safe in those areas because they may be more dense than other areas, more compact. And as you'll hear from uh, Fish and Game as well, um, muzzle loaders are allowed in these areas. And the modern shotgun and the muzzle loader is by far more velocity and more power, and it's allowed in these areas than what you would get out of the lever action carbine in these handgun rounds. And we're only talking about three rounds to uh, keep it short and easy to deal with. That would be the 357 Magnum, the 44 Magnum, and the 45 Long Colt. Um, if in the future it's determined that some of the other rounds need to be added, we can address that in the future. But for now, we're only talking about these three specific rounds in a lever action carbine, which by definition has a barrel 18 inches or shorter. And we're basically just trying to increase the safety. Uh, the amendment that's put on basically takes the amount of cartridges allowed in the rifle from five to six to clarify and, and remove confusion in the fishing game laws where a pistol could have six and a rifle could have five. Now all guns will have six. I see, okay. I'll take any questions. questions. Senator Waters with a question. Yeah, thank you, Representative. So uh, basically this is just, um, getting statute to keep up with the equipment, right? Correct. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Any further questions? Seeing none. Thank you, our representative. We appreciate it. Um, Jen? Next is Representative Lang. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for taking my testimony again. Uh, Representative Tim Lang, Belknap County 4, uh, Chair of the, ha of the House Fish and Game Committee. Again, I think Representative Spillane did a great job testifying. Um, again, this came out 20 to zero out of the House uh, committee. It was on consent. It was a voice vote on the House. Um, the one thing I will add and, and just emphasize on this, we took the bills in different order. We took the one you're taking next first in, our, in the House session. And it's when we realized there was a conflict, well, not a conflict, but a, a situation where the number of rounds in a firearm could be a problem. Um, and, and we saw more in handguns where if you're carrying a handgun for personal defense, you could, you could carry six rounds. But if you are carrying a handgun for the purpose of hunting, you only have five rounds in it. And it created some issues with law enforcement with, with uh, Colonel Jordan. And the same goes with if you were hunting, uh, you know, rifle hunting. Um, again, if you used your handgun that had six rounds in it, you'd be in technical violation of the law. And so in talking to uh, Colonel Jordan, we came to the agreement that we just make everything six to make it easy, um, that make all rounds consistent across the board. So if you're hunting deer with a rifle, you can have six rounds. If you're hunting deer with a pistol, you can have six rounds. If you're carrying a handgun for the purposes of personal protection while hunting, you'd also have six rounds. So again, it cleaned up that language. Um, and I, I think Jim spoke to, uh, we talked significantly about the balancing of the fact that we're, we're allowing these lever action carbines in the pistol area um, where normally only pistols are allowed and, and the increased ballistics. And what we, we, everyone seemed to come to the same conclusion that while there is a minor increase in ballistics, um, the, there's a significantly greater increase in safety by using a lever action firearm for taking uh, uh, an animal versus a handgun shooting offhand. And so for that reason, uh, the committee voted 20 to zero and brought it out and I it's presented to you. I encourage you to vote yes. Thank you, Representative. Any questions from the committee? Seeing none. Jen? And the last person that we have signed up to speak is the Honorable Joe Hannon. 
Uh, good afternoon, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Joe Hannon. I'm the Vice President for Gun Owners of New Hampshire. Uh, I'd like to tell you that I had a very long, eloquent, and pretty good testimony prepared, but the previous two speakers and the good senator from District 4 pretty much said everything for me. So uh, it's a housekeeping bill. There is safety increase. There are safety increases with this, and um, we ask that you pass this uh, as soon as you can. Thank you. Thank you very much, for, uh, Honorable Joanne. Whatever. <laughs> um, Hi, Joe. How you doing? Good afternoon, Senator. Nice to questions see you. at all from the committee? Seeing none. And nobody else to speak? That's all that I had signed up to speak, Senator. So if anybody else is interested in speaking on House Bill 342, if you could speak, raise your hand now. I'm not seeing anyone, Senator. Seeing none, we will close the hearing on... HB 342, do we have time for HB 1492? Let's do it. Okay, the, the prime sponsor is Representative McDonald. Welcome, Representative. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of uh, Energy and National Resources Committee. Uh, my name is John McDonald and I'm representative for Cal District 6, which is the community of uh, Wolfboro. And I'm here to introduce House Bill 192, which addresses the issue of pistols permitted to take deer. Uh, this came, this bill came at the request of uh, constituents. And back in October of 2019, one of my constituents wrote to Fish and Game, uh, sharing the concerns about the difference between a 45 ACP and a 45 coat. And uh, we received a response back from Dan Bergeron. Uh, who I believe is the game program supervisor for Fish and Game. Uh, I'll just read it to you. Uh, the regulations outlining the calibers can be used for deer hunting in town to special rules is in state statute, not the department's administrative rules. This means that to add new calibers would have to be done through the state legislature and can't be done by the department. That said, if a bill was proposed by the state legislature to add 45 ACP to the list of allowable calibers, I don't foresee the department having any objections to that. I'm not sure why the Pacific calibers were included or left out when the law was written, other than they likely just in, uh, included whatever was the most popular hunting round at that time. Uh, I sent an uh, email to uh, Mr. Bergeron listing, uh, I believe it was eight calibers to see if Fish and Game had any objections or had any input. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't received a response to him. Uh, I, I think it's time for change as far as the, the uh, loading of, of weapons or cartridges has improved tremendously back from when this law was first written. And I would ask that you folks, uh, you senators, please uh, support this, this bill. It uh, passed Fish and Game 17 to three and it passed the house on a uh, voice vote. And I'm free for any questions if you may have them. Questions from the committee. Seeing them. Thank you, Representative. Appreciate your Thank testimony. you, Mr. Chairman. So next we have Representative Lang. Representative Lang, welcome back. Thanks. <laughs> and I promise you this is my last one. Uh, even though I'm a co-sponsor in your next bill, I'm gonna let Representative Pearl take care of that one. Um, again, it was as I said, this came out of committee on a 17-3 vote, was put on a consent calendar, was passed on a voice vote on the House floor. This is simply a modernization bill bringing uh, this statute up into uh, current current calibers that are current, uh, commonly used in, in, in firearms. And lastly, and the most important aspect to me is the, uh, on this is also where we, we clean up the number of rounds where we have that conflict between personal protection and hunting and number of rounds you were allowed to do either. And as Fish and Game uh, testified in our committee, this, this was making an occasional accidental criminal out of somebody who Fish and Game uh, officers would come into contact with in the woods and it was either had a handgun with five rounds or six rounds and using it inappropriately based on that round, the number of rounds. So again, this uniforms, this creates uniformity in our, in our laws and I would highly uh, recommend you pass the bill. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. Questions from the committee? Seeing none. And next is the Honorable Joe Hannon. Welcome back, Joe. It's been a while. <laughs> Thank you, Senators. Uh, I know it's getting late. It's a nice day, so I'll be very, very brief. Um, basically, right now, we have legal calibers like vanilla and chocolate. This is just adding strawberry, pistachio, and whatever your favorite flavor is. Uh, it's also increasing, um, like they said, for six rounds for law enforcement to make their job easier. And I ask you to please pass this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Any 
questions? Seeing none. The last person center I have up to speak is a William McDuff. Uh, I do not see Mr. McDuff here. So Mr. McDuff, if you are, if you could raise your hand or if anybody else is interested in speaking on House Bill 192, if you could raise your hand now. And I'm not seeing anyone center. All right, any questions? Okay, no questions, obviously. So uh, let's uh, close the hearing on 192 and we'll take up 226. Okay, we have the prime sponsor, Representative Pearl. Representative Pearl, you have the floor. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you all, I, all the senators on energy and natural resources. Good to see you all again. I am uh, Representative Howard Pearl. For the record, I represent Merrimack District 26, the towns of Loudoun, Canterbury, Northfield, Boswin, and Ward 3 of Franklin. I am here to introduce to you House Bill 226, an act relative to the repeal of laws on produce safety. This is a very simple bill. Um, it moves the sunset date because when off to 2026, because when this bill originally, uh, the produce safety laws were put into play, we put them into sunset in 2021. And so we're approaching that date and the Department of Agriculture contacted me and asked me to submit this bill. And additionally, the second function of the bill, it moves some stop sale language into the bill because in uh, 426, there was stop sale language for the other parts of statute, but it was sort of technically specific to 426 and not to uh, this part of 426A, which is relative to this chapter of law. And so just to make sure that the commissioner had the ability to put a stop sale on any produce that they found were in violation of 426A. We uh, modified that language that was in 426 and moved it over to 426A as well, just to make sure that they were covered. So that is the two functions that this bill serves and I'll be happy to take any questions. Senator Guida with a question. Senator Guida, you are muted. He sounds really good. Yeah, I would prefer that I stay that way. <laughs> uh, welcome, uh, Howard. Good to see you, um, so to speak. What does that section that you move this to, what does that deal with 426? So 426 is the other uh, parts of statute. I don't have it up right in front of me, but it, it deals with other functions that the uh, that the uh, commissioner can do through the department. And that stop sale language, it, it deals with, with other areas of things that they regulate. And so we just took that language and moved it over, used it again in 426A. We sh I shouldn't say moved it over. We copied it and just modified it to specifically fit the produce regulations. It's very similar. If you go back and read it, you'll find this in 426 as well. All right. So follow up? Yeah, follow up. So I presume then this is for like selling something prohibited or something that's tainted or something has been found problematic for health reasons? It could be. Um, it, it's all of that and, and perhaps even a little bit more. There could be some record keeping violations that could occur as well, because the uh, this specifically relates to the FISMA regulations, the Food Safety Modernization Act that was passed by Congress a few years back. And this is how we implemented it into New Hampshire. And so thank you. Uh, that's why it's a separate section. But you're very welcome. Thanks for the question. How's the sugar in? been pretty slow. It's too warm. As much as you uh, all like 65 and 70, I'd like it to be about 45 and maybe even a little snow. <laughs> Some of my uh, my trees have been leaking earlier when it was colder and uh, my dog seems to like the icicles. So when they uh, <laughs> probably have a little sweet to them. Just a little bit of sweet. I do too. I don't know if that's healthy or not. Any other questions from the committee? All right. Seeing none. Thank you, Howard. Appreciate it. Thank uh, and Anybody else here to testify? So no one else signed up to speak on the bill, Senator. So if anyone's looking to speak on House Bill 226, if you could please raise your hand now. Not seeing anyone, Senator. All right, seeing that. So we'll close the hearing on uh, 226. And we got a couple of minutes before we get to the next bill or? We're ready to go. We are, let's do We're it. We're back on time. All so, right. The next bill is House Bill 193 and Representative Smith is the prime sponsor. Representative Smith, welcome. 
Good afternoon, Senator Avert and members of the committee. I am really impressed watching you fly through those last bills. I thought I'd be up on the dock around four o'clock at, at the rate things were going. Oh, we got a great team here. <laughs> you do, you do. Uh, for the record, I'm Suzanne Smith. I represent Grafton County District 8, the towns of Plymouth, Hebron, and Holderness, and I am the prime sponsor of House Bill 193. New Hampshire has more forested land per square mile than any state. And we take timber trespass seriously. It provides strong penalties for those who cut trees on property without the owner's permission. Right now, when a logger is hired by a landowner who provides the wrong information about where their property boundary is, the logger can be prosecuted for timber trespass. House Bill 193 expands the timber trespass law to include one who causes trees to be cut, felled, destroyed, injured, or carried away, i.e. the owner who misstates where his property boundary is. By adding this phrase to the statute, the law will now clarify the responsibilities of all parties involved in the harvesting of timber relative to the timber trespass. It explicitly extends culpability to the landowner who may have provided erroneous information about the boundaries and enabled the timber trespass to occur. It does not lessen the shared responsibility of the timber harvester to conduct his or her due diligence to ensure the correct location of boundary lines. The bill does not increase or decrease the penalties for timber trespass, but makes those who cause the trespass just as liable as the logger who cuts the trees. The House Resources Committee passed this bill unanimously last year and this, and it passed the House on the consent calendar both times. Division of Forest and Lands, the TOA, and the New Hampshire Farm Bureau all support House Bill 193, and I ask for your support. And if you have any questions, I will try to answer them. Senator Waters with a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. You know, having a cousin who was a logger for decades until a tree decided to fall the wrong way. Um, but uh, anyways, would it be, isn't it really the case here that, that this is something that the, you know, the logger, the, the person out with the chainsaw doing the harvesting is, is going to want because it really makes sure that the um, landowner is going to do his or her due diligence so they're not left hanging out there by, them, by themselves? Good possibility that that would be a good reason for this law. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, further questions from the committee? Wow, you're good, Susan. Thank you. Um, all right, thank you. Uh, all right, and uh, next we'll hear from Jason Stock, I, I assume? That's right, Senator. Welcome, Jason. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Well, good afternoon. Uh, great to be here. For the record, I'm Jason Stock. I'm the Executive Director of the New Hampshire Timberland Owners Association, and uh, come here today to support House Bill 193, um, as the sponsor had said, this bill um, really, it, it expands the culpability to not only the, the individual actually cutting the tree, but the individual that may have, that would have caused the tree to be cut. Um, for all the reasons she stated, plus the fact that this will bring consistency with this law, it aligns this law with some of the other timber laws on the books, particularly the basal area and slash excuse me, the, the slash laws, it really provides some consistency. And so um, for that reason, I, I'm happy to testify today in support of this, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. I hope you find this, uh, find this bill uh, ought to pass. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. You're very eloquent. <laughs> uh, any, any questions from the committee? <laughs> Seeing no questions, uh, is there anybody else uh, here to sign up or to speak? So I don't have anyone else signed up, Senator. If there's anyone else that would like to speak on House Bill 193, if you could please raise your hand now. And I'm not seeing anybody, Senator. All right, let's close the hearing on that. And is there a motion to move into exec? So move. Senator Gray moves to move into exec. Second. Seconded by Senator Waters. Senator Gray. Yes. Senator, I'm sorry, did I, I said Sen Senator Gaida. Yes. Right. Senator Waters. Yes. Senator Perkins Quoka. Yes. Senator Avard. Yes. All right. Can we, let's, uh, I want to do the Senate bills, but I would like to do this one that while it's fresh on my mind with the um, 
the one that we just heard. Uh, is there a I move out to pass on House Bill 193. Second. Discussion? Seeing none. Senator Gaida? Yes. Senator Gray? Yes. Senator Waters? Yes. Senator Perkins Quoka? Yes. Senator Avard? Yes. Is there a motion to move into consent? So moved. Second. All right. Senator Gray? Yes. Senator uh, Gaida? Yes. I know you two guys look alike. So Senator Waters. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I didn't say that. Just, Our crowning <laughs> achievement. I think it's the uh, the glasses, maybe. <laughs> and, um, Senator Waters. Yes. Senator Perkins Quoka. Yes. Senator Avard. Yes. Uh, Senator Gray, would you like to take that out? Fine. All right. So Bob, I suppose on the screens, if we did it just right, we could be like the cone heads. <laughs> Pretty close. <laughs> I am dyslexic, so I don't know if that helps. Um, are we okay to do uh, 226? Let's keep All rolling. Right. All right, let's do. Uh, is there a motion on 226? I'll move out to pass. Second. Okay, so Senator Waters. Yes. Senator Gaida. Yes. Senator Gray. Yes. Senator Perkins Quoka? Yep. Senator Avard, yes. Consent. Is there a motion to move on, on consent? Consent, yep. Yeah. Second. Waters, on consent, Senator Gaida seconds. Senator Waters? Yes. Senator Gaida? Yes. Senator Gray? Yes. Senator Perkins Quoka? Yes. Senator Avard, yes. Senator Waters, would you like to take that out on consent? Sure, sure. All right. Are we on 192? Good to go. Okay, is that that's a motion of auto yeah, sure, I'll, I'll move auto pass. <laughs> is there a second? Second. Seconded by Senator Gray. Discussion. Okay, Senator. I'll say I'll just just this is a little aside. Um, I'm thinking back to like 14 years ago when I was at a house fishing game, and I think that the the d issue about having one empty chamber in a round was a safety issue for when uh, weapons were being, firearms were being transported in cars or on snowmobiles or whatever. And I, I, I mean, this is just housekeeping. It, it ought to, it ought to be the six with modern safety equipment and so on. So, I think it's a good thing to do. <clears throat> Any further discussion? Seeing none. Senator Waters. Yes. Senator Gaida. Yes. Senator Gray? Yes. Senator Perkins Quoka? Yes. Senator Avard? Yes. Uh, um, would like to take this out? Or would you like it on consent? Move consent. Okay. Second. Senator Gray, consent. Senator Gaida, seconded. Uh, Senator Gray? Yes. Senator Gaida? Yes. Senator Waters? Yep. Senator Perkins Quoka? Yep. Senator Avard? Yes. On consent. And Senator Gray, we'd love for you to take that out. Okay. Okay, so um, <laughs> HB 342, how are we on that one? Move on to pass. I'm Second. sorry. The voices all kind of blended. Was that Senator Gray? Move on to pass. Yes, so Senator Gray out to pass and Senator Gaida seconded. Discussion. All right, we're doing really good. We rock and roll here. Uh, Senator Gray. Yes. Senator Gaida. Yes. Senator Waters. Yep. Senator Perkins Quoka. Yes. Senator Avard, yes. Is there a motion to consent? Consent. All right, well, that was a tie. Second. So, Second. <laughs> <laughs> so Senator Gaida gets uh, the, the first then. Um, Senator Gaida. Yes. Senator Gray. Yes. Senator Perkins Quoka. Yes. Senator Gray, ah, uh, Waters. Yep. <laughs> Senator Abard. Yes, okay. So Senator Gaida, you get to take this out? Sure. Uh, I do like the animal cruelty bill. Um, I'm about to pass. Second. Second. Discussion. Well, I think they got it well worked out in the house. I mean, I think that taking thing is just essential. I mean, obviously for trapping or whatever else. So um, I think it's pretty well vetted. And, um, you know, I think it's really consistency. If we're, if we're saying this is for a wild animal in captivity, it ought to be for an animal not in captivity, I suppose. And uh, 
I was reassured by Sanderson and Jordan about enforcement issues. And um, so fair enough, fair yeah, enough. I agree. Further discussion? Okay, Senator Guida. Yeah, I'll vote for the bill. I'm just a little nervous about definitional stuff, you know, tortured. Well, you know, I mean, um, I think we all have a concept of what that is, but can it carry forth into a legal definition or a legal situation where in a court it's being tried? But I think the bill is well intended. I think it's it's as good as I've seen language crafted. So I'll, I'll go with it. Yeah, and I, I mean, Bob raises a good point. And I, I, what makes, you know, it's it's the same language that's in all the other animal cruelty statutes. So I, I just imagine it's been tried and tested in the courts. But, you know, if it were new language here, I'd be a little skeptical. But since they're just replicating what we already have and have, have for decades, I suppose it's, it's okay, but but yeah, Senator, but, Senator Gray, good question. Yes, any thoughts? No, Senator Perkins, yes, okay. Uh, right. no, I think this is a great bill. <laughs> this is its second time through the legislature, so I, I do think it's been vetted. And um, and I thought the sponsor was very knowledgeable and spoke really well to all the concerns. So I'm, I'm supportive, okay. So we'll start with you, Senator per Perkins Polka. Okay, yes. Senator Waters. Yep. Senator Gray. Yes. Senator Gaida. I'm out of order. No, yes. <laughs> uh, exactly. And Senator Avard, yes. I move consent. Okay. Second. Second. Uh, okay, Senator Waters. Yep. Senator Gaida. Yes. Senator Gray. Yes. Senator Perkins Quoka. Yeah, and I'll take it out if you want. Well, you gotta let me vote first. Okay. <laughs> Senator Avery, yes. And Senator Perkins Quoka, would you like to take it out? I would be happy to, Mr. <laughs> All right, wonderful. I wasn't gonna leave you out. That was my intention, by the way. And have you worked on it before. Uh, SB 109, uh, has everybody seen the amendment? No, not yet. Chairman, I just wanted to inform the committee that I filed a declaration related to this bill, but I will be participating. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, basically, in our last discussion, uh, the, um, well, up to five megawatts was uh, in part of the, the language. Uh, you don't want it at five megawatts, otherwise ISO gets there. So it goes uh, less than five megawatts. And then uh, the exclusivity, uh, which um, uh, oh, Donna Gamarsh had, had mentioned something about exclusive to the, uh, the cities and towns. Uh, that was important, so, um, and we agreed to add that to the language. Uh, discussion. So, yeah. I, I would like to see it, although I'm not sure it's achievable, uh, that it wasn't restricted to single municipality. Or, um, that, you mean, what do you mean by that, Bob? Yeah, so as I look at it, um, one or more customers' political subdivisions, right, all customers are located within the same utility franchise service, service yeah, territory. The host shall be located in the same municipality as all group members if the facility started after January 1st of 21. So what they're doing is, in a sense, uh, perhaps giving an advantage to previously existing ones and limiting those that are coming online to be having to be within the same municipality, the host having to be in the same municipality uh, as the other group members. That's just a concern I have. But again, it's, this is a step forward and I'll be voting for it. I think this is a step forward. And I, I know that we've dropped this uh, be, you know, for, to all interested parties. And uh, like we said in testimony earlier, this is a baby step. And if we can, if we can get to this point, uh, with the governor on the board, uh, as we've, we've talked with uh, many people that have had discussions with them indirectly, uh, this was uh, this is the baby steps we've been looking for, and we can always uh, advance in the future if it works out well. So this is, uh, in my humble opinion, this is this is this is a great step forward. Anything else that we deviate from it could could jeopardize the bill. My, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Um, yeah. I, mean, I think Senator Guider raises a really good point, and I hope that this is a first step because 
you know, I, I do think that what, you know, trying to do it to expand it a little bit would be would run into the governor's objections. And it also would probably raise some issues about tra about transmission and under the definitions of of, of uh, net metering that are here. So um, I, I think it's great. And, you know, I, I thank you for the, for bringing it forward. And I, I just think it's uh, the municipalities are really hungry for this and it'll be good. But let's hope it's the first step. Huh? I agree. Yeah. Any further discussion on the amendment? So I'll move the amendment. I'll second it. Okay. Per Senator Perkins Quoka? No, I, I was just going to echo the comments of my colleagues. I mean, having everybody located in the same municipality was the was the concern I raised um, in the initial public hearing. So I, I'll also be voting for it. I also agree. I'd love to see us progress in the future. Wonderful. Senator Gray? Any comments, any the, thoughts? The language that starts on line nine mm -hmm. goes to 12. The part, the last part of that, that says any district or entity created for a special purpose administered or funded by any of the above named governmental units. And it's got an S on it. All right. So doesn't that allow those people to get together, form a group, and do this? I believe within the service, designated service area, it allows to do this, yes. It's my only comment. All right. So, uh, is there a motion to ought to pass on the amendment? Moved. Second. Okay, starting with the uh, Senator Gaida. Yes. Senator Waters. Yes. Senator Perkins Quoka. Yes. Senator Gray. Yes. Senator Avard. Yes. Is there a motion to move on the bill? Moved as amended. Okay. Second. All right. Discussion? Seeing none. Senator Gaida. Yes. Senator Wa uh, Waters. Yep. Senator Perkins Quoka. Yes. Senator Gray. Yes. Senator Avard. Yes. Is there a motion for consent? Moved. Second. Discussion. All right. Senator Gaida. Yes. Senator Waters. Yes. Senator Gray. Yes. Senator Perkins Quoka. Yes. Senator Avard. Yes. And I'll take it out. Thank you. <laughs> All right, next, uh, SB 113. And Mr. Chairman, if I may, it, it occurs to me that um, I may have a um, conflict uh, here because I do have solar panels in my house and may in fact benefit from rec payments. Although I know that the change, there is no change in the amount for solar here in the bill, but I will participate. I just wanted to mention that and I will, but I will participate. Excellent. Okay, uh, discussion. Well, I would say I, what, I, what I think is good, you know, what Senator Bradley do, has done here is he levels the playing field. And that's important. And the uh, neutrality, technological neutrality, I think that's a good principle that, uh, that is, is good here. And, um, and uh, so I, I it's not that it's housekeeping, but I, I just think that what it does is it brings some consistency to this and um, gives some kind of stability uh, projecting to the future for folks who are investing in this. And the, the hydrogen power, right? That's kind of interesting, isn't it? Yeah. And as I said in the hearing, there's going to be a big play on that uh, yeah. from lots of sources. So it's good to get our statute kind of ready for that. Okay. So is there a motion? I'm about to pass. About to, I'll yeah. second it. Okay. And just for formalities, discussion, seeing none, uh, Senator Waters. Yes. Senator Gaida. Yes. Senator Gray. Yes. Senator Perkins Quoka. Yes. Senator Avard. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Is there a motion to move to consent? Yeah, consent. Second. Excellent. Discussion. Seeing none, Senator Waters. Yes. Senator Gaida. 
Yes. Senator Gray. Yes. Senator Perkins Quoka. Yes. Senator Avard. Yes. Who would like to take it out on consent? Well, I could do it, if, but right. if somebody else wants to, fine. But uh, Senator Waters, we'll let you do that. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. But you must promise to wax eloquent. <laughs> oh, I'm not going to say a word. It's unconsenting. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not waxing anything. <laughs> Excellent. Wonderful. We had a great committee hearing. Is there a motion to move out of uh, uh, exec? Moved. Moved out of exec. And seconded by uh, Senator Perkins Quoka and thirded by Senator Gray. <laughs> uh, so we'll start with Senator Gaida. Yes. Senator Perkins Quoka. Yes. Senator Waters. Yes. Senator Gray? Yes. And Senator Avard? Yes. All motion right. Adjourn. Second. And, and motion to adjourn by Senator Waters, seconded by Senator Gaida. Senator Waters? Yes. Senator Gaida? Yes. Senator Gray? Yes. Senator Perkins Quoka? Yes. Senator Avard? Yes. Well done, folks. Thank you very much. Your Congratulations, question. Kevin. Oh, thank you. On to, uh, yes, now the battle begins. <laughs> yeah, really. On the House. Hopefully we pass it. Everything, but we'll see. All right. Grace to you. Here all outside. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you.